Hello and welcome to Top Gnosis. Today we're talking to sociologist, uh, author, podcaster, fellow Canadian, Dr. Ashley Frawley of Abouche uh, Mindfulness. Uh, Dr. Frawley, we'll, we'll just uh, jump right into it. So I've heard a lot about how wonderful, and it's actually like a sure sign of societal progress, that mindfulness is now taught and offered in corporate workplaces and in public schools, ranging from literally elementary, maybe even kindergarten, all the way up to high schools, in universities, in government bureaucracies. So what might be some issues with this narrative? Like, I mean, isn't it just wonderful that mindfulness is everywhere? So the thesis of some of what I've written on this, so I've got a book coming out soon with a couple of chapters on mindfulness, and then I, I publish a paper with my colleague Daniel Nering called Mindfulness and the Psychological Imagination. So, and uh, so I and I talk about it in a lot of podcasts and so on, but the argument that I put forward is that it's, you know, a lot of these things are harmless in themselves, right? And, and I don't doubt that people find a lot of joy in these kinds of practices. And I would never say, don't do it. Like, that's not the point, you know, whatever floats your boat, that's fine. But what I'm interested in is the way that as a discourse, when it emerges into the public sphere and it goes into corporations and it goes into schools and so on. It does so as part of a narrative about social problems and about their causes and solutions. So it's not like, oh, like engage in this practice because you might want to, or it's nice or whatever. It's because it's going to, you know, help you to concentrate and, you know, the economy loses $4 billion a year in such and such because of lost productivity of you know it's, it's always part of some kind of narrative and, and then as you see government documents for example so the uk government released a a kind of survey of mindfulness and its usefulness to policy and they implicitly put the blame for a wide range of social problems on the internal world of the individual that it, it always begins with this kind of critique of the subject of you know, people uh, are unable to hold their attention and don't worry, this is totally normal. This is it. This is part of the human condition and so on. There's nothing wrong with this. We're going to come in and we're going to fix it. We're going to provide this kind of fix. And it's going to then empower you and allow you to do all the things that you would do if only you didn't have this sort of internal kind of uh, barrier. And I, I, call, I kind of put this into a formulation or the, a descriptive formulation of what the rhetoric is saying, what the discourse is saying. And it's sort of like, First, promote X before, first, we must promote X before Y can ever be achieved. And you can see this with a lot of therapeutic discourses. It's not just mindfulness. This is what the self-esteem movement did. So you have this world of really wicked issues, issues that are really difficult to solve. You know, we have a class society. Yes, people move up and down in the class structure, but the structure itself is there. It's quite rigid. And, it, and the problems that come out of it are stubbornly resistant to change. Quite a few problems. And so people, uh, policymakers have been receptive to claims that say, well, you know, the problem is that first we need to promote X before we can ever even start thinking about Y. And this has become powerful even in like leftist movements and in social movements. For instance, Gloria Steinem, you know, was very much a champion of social, of self-esteem. And it was this idea of like, how can we ever expect to stand up to the patriarchy if we don't first build our self-esteem and our self-efficacy and so on. So what, it, what winds up happening is there's this deferral of answering these wicked issues until the day when the subject is sufficiently rehabilitated. And so you wind up with this unending sort of cycle. It's not really a cycle, these unending waves of therapeutic fads, which promise to ultimately solve the problem of the subject. And I believe that I have lost you. I think your power, your your internet has gone out. So I'm just going to go ahead and wait. There we go. What? Did I lose you? No, oh, uh, I, I don't know what happened there, but the uh, internet gremlins. Uh, oh, no. Well, I did manage to finish the point that I was making, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, you know, that, uh, talking about some of these, these discourses that, that you're discussing, like, you know, I, I've heard sort of similar discourses that, that seem to be very dominant in quote-unquote Western thought and the Anglo sphere going back a long time. I'm thinking like Puritan Protestantism to like self-help New Age business advice. Yeah. You know, it's, it says that the problem is people, like what you're saying. 
like especially uneducated and working people like they're weak they're sinful they're prone to making wrong choices or yep. they're not aware of their many flaws but but isn't mindfulness actually the opposite of this doesn't it say that we're basically good and if we just you know came to the here and now we'd have superpowers well that's exactly this is the thing that a lot of these kinds of this sort of romantic view of subjectivity says that human beings are essentially good, but they're just led astray by all of these outside forces. But at the end of the day, the start and the end point is the subject. Like if only we could, you know, free the subject from X, Y, Z, we'd ha we wouldn't have these problems. But also there's this idea that it's about optimization. So people will say, oh, we're just optimizing people. And that's how it appears, right? It appears as a discourse of optimization. Oh, you could actually just do things better. Oh, so much, you know, you, you could just do things uh, so much more effectively, so much more efficiently. But I don't think that's the case because if you actually look at the at the and, and look at the major claims that sort of circulate in the public sphere uh, and get repeated again and again and again, which tells us that they resonate, that they that this is a claim that has worked, and people go, ah, yes, ah, yes, that's 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 it, that's you've got it. It is a critique of of subjectivity. So it's it's like without this newfangled expertise, you are quite likely to be led, led astray. Like human nature is, is basically good, but you need someone to come in and liberate this. So society becomes this kind of like sickness that pulls us away from our true human nature, which is something like asocial, implied to be anyway, and that this thing will bring us back. But it doesn't matter what the why human beings are said to be the problem at the end of the day you are the problem and if all and like i wrote an article about this in compact magazine and it had this very provocative title mindfulness is mind control <laughs> and did is, you choose the title or was it editorial oh, no okay. of course it's the editorial it's not a bad it's not a bad title okay. and it's an interesting one so I, I that's the first episode of my podcast was looking at how mindfulness makes its way into these discourses of of new new technologies for brain monitoring and like how many times i saw like mind and control in the same sentence i'm getting closer and closer no nobody's bothered by this and then there was this one like ceo that without a hint of self-awareness goes oh you know this new app it's the ultimate in mind control like i'm gonna help you to control your mind thing and so i wrote this article and my point was that First, the subject has to be destroyed. First, there is, you have this idea that it's all, it's just about optimization. No, because first you have to create a need. The first, like, it's not just like, oh, your life is fine, but here's this new thing that you should do and spend money on and buy things. No, it's always that there's some problem. There's some impediment. And the cause might be society, the, the sort of sick society, the pathological society that infects you or whatever. But at the end of the day, you're, you have to understand that you have this deficit and you have this need. And, and then it's linked to this array of social problems. So if only we could get people to be mindful consumers, then X. If only we could get people to be mindful parents. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. You know, it's the rat race and so on. Oh, don't we all blah, blah, blah. They're always saying that. And then if only we could just go in and inculcate this thing, then this problem will be solved. And so it's always the, the, the first step is always sort of creating a problem, problematizing the subject or creating a, a narrative in which the cause of X problem is something within human subjects. And I, anyway, so I wrote this article and I tweeted it out and a ton of the responses were like, you idiot, mindfulness is the exact opposite. If all, if more people practice mindfulness, we wouldn't have had Brexit. We wouldn't have had this. We and I was like, that's exactly the argument that I am trying to make is that it is people being mindless, not their fault. It's not your fault. You know, it's modern society. It's this, it's that. But if only we could come in and fix you, then then the problem would be solved. So it's implicitly prob putting the subject at the heart of a system of social problems in the exact same way that, as you rightly say, all these other discourses were doing, going back very, very far. And it's a very common kind of current of modernity, I suppose, and it probably is pre-modern as well, of if there's a problem that comes from brains of individuals like you can see this in like early organic analogies of human society right where society is a you know go to herbert spencer or somebody and obviously most people will go to durkheim but spencer's the more interesting one but society is like this functioning organism right and all the different things they all through differentiation you know you've got the post office as the circulatory system or whatever and parliament is the brain and everything 
fits together because of this differentiation of functions. And if something goes wrong, it's akin to a disease of this healthy social body. So then people who are don't fit into this or appear to be causing problems for the healthy social body will need to be cut out like a cancer. And you can see where that went wrong, terribly wrong. But that underlying, underlying kind of idea is, is still there. But it's this idea that there's something wrong with the individual if something goes wrong. And there's a very, very long, it's been scientized and so on. It's scientized in, in, in Spencer. Uh, and obviously Spencer's very much, you know, like a, you can see a lot of forerunnings of eugenics in, the, in what he's saying. But now it's been kind of flipped on its head where before it was like, the society is good. It's a healthy functioning organiz organism. And the individuals and groups who cause problems or are problems um, are this malfunctioning, this like cancerous mal malignant force. Now society itself is sick. It's this flipped kind of thing. It's the, the sick society is the sort of idea. You see this over and over and over again with like going back to like Eric Fromm. But you have books like how many books have been called Affluenza? 15 <laughs> books with that in the title. And it's like society is a disease and it infects individuals. And and this malaise is sort of spreading. And even and this this kind of sick society perspective is in many ways quite pessimistic. But at the end of the day, the the resolutions are similar. You know, the kind version of eugenics <laughs> was, you know, I mean it was no, not not the kind version of eugenics. There's no kind version eugenics although there was a kind version where they thought they were actually helping people but i mean the kind version of social pathology which is the kind of way of looking at social problems that eugenics fits into so there's a kind version of that which is giving people a moral education and this is the same thing uh, at the end of the day the result the the solution to social problems is a moral education so there's this kind of agreement that in order to solve problems you need to go into the subject and re reconfigure and fix them and then that will empower them to go out and fix society. So first promote X. And of course it doesn't work. You know, you have like endless waves because they've misunderstood the problem. The problem is not coming, like human beings are not squatting outside society. We are social beings. It's not like human nature is this thing that just never changes. And society, we'd be like out of step with society. It makes no sense if you look at like the enormous variation in human societies around the world historically over like, I don't know, however, 100,000 years of anatomically modern humans. We have like so many different ways of living. And yet, what? Our, our society uniquely is out of step with human nature. Okay, I find that very hard to believe. But the, people will say, oh, so we have to like go in and, and, and fix the subject. But of course it doesn't work. And another, so self-esteem is, oh, it's a, it's a social vaccine. It's going to fix people. It's going to like, uniquely like free people. And you're not going to have teenage pregnancy. It's going to increase educational attainment. Just teach people self-efficacy, blah, blah, blah. Of course, it doesn't work because these are problems that are outside of the subject. You don't have like a differentiations in educational performance and the outcome of that, which wouldn't matter, except that the outcome of that is we funnel people into different classes. The class of society is still there, though. Like, you can change the nature of the working class and give them tons and tons of education. But you're still going to have an underclass. You're still going to have a working class. You're still going <laughs> to change who gets left out at the end of the day. But someone's going to get left out at the end of the day. Anyways, so things are resistant to change. Oh, oh, oh I've got a new one. Self-esteem is so silly, Martin Seligman saying. Self-esteem is so silly. It's become this all-purpose thing. It's puffery. It's silly. Aha. What we should really be for aiming for is happiness. We need to promote happiness. And he compares, I'm not kidding, he compares promotion of happiness in schools and so on all around the world. He had this big, bright project for everything. Happiness in all, all institutions, happiness research. He compares it to immunizations. Hmm. Uh, is, there, is there a book where I could read more about this? This is my book that's coming out soon. <laughs> yeah. Well, please, please, so, continue. Yeah. So this is my book, Significant Emotions, the thesis of that book. So, um, John Basconcello, so I'm not sure if it's cello. Yeah, said, you know, obviously, famously, self-esteem is a, is a social vaccine. And then Martin Seligman says, oh, that's silly. Happiness is like an immunization. And then you have, you have the same metaphor over and over and over again. It doesn't work. And they, there's no shortage of, a new, of new ones waiting in the wings. No, I've got it. I've got it. And, never, and the critics of the old become harbingers of the new. And the problem is that they, what winds up happening is that these things, they don't simply do nothing. The narrative that underpins them is never, is not really questioned. You know, that ultimately there's a problem within the human brain and our, and our behaviors and so on that go out into the world and create these issues. 
we actually become more and more pessimistic. It's not like, oh, well, maybe we've misunderstood the problem. It's the problem is deeper than we thought. And this is the, the sort of dark side of some of these discourses where I think, oh, it's, it's fine. It's not a big deal. But the issue is that people, when it doesn't work, people get more and more pessimistic and they become more and more disparaging of human subjectivity. Oh, human beings are really messed up, m maybe beyond repair. Yeah. The, this idea, and, and I know we're, you know, you're kind of discussing it and we're kind of going through it a, a lot. And I don't want to say the words dominant narrative, dominant ideology too many more times, but this, this infection by society dominant narrative that, that you're talking about, you know, you can kind of find it in romanticism, but it's, it's, become so powerful in in the mid 20th century in 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 modern modernity but, you know you find it in the beats but then it just seems to explode in the 1960s and it's 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 almost common sense now i find among both among people who are not political among uh people who consider themselves on the left consider themselves on the right it's it's not interrogated it's just left as the the background it, it's what's generally accepted that the society is this infection that that's uh, cutting us off from from our potential, from being good, from from what have you. So just to clarify, and and I know you kind of did say this, but to, to make it obvious, so the would the mindfulness narrative say that that this is an escape from this infection? Well, it's it's hard to. This is a difficulty, right? When you study something like this, there's obviously. It's a heterogeneous narrative. Like there, there are tons and tons of people making all sorts of different claims. And I'm not trying to like critique Buddhism or meditation or transcendental meditation or this or that or that or, you know, going back thousands of years. This is this would be impossible. And also beside the point, the point is that I'm looking at when something enters into the public sphere and becomes a narrative of social problems. What does it narrate? What does it tell us? when it gets repeated again and again and again. So you could make all sorts of claims, and there are all sorts of claims about mindfulness that are made in a sort of backstage or less public arenas than, you know, the speeches of policymakers or when you are talking to The Guardian or something like that about your new book. And then the point, the interesting thing is when people pull out specific claims and those resonate, those get repeated again and again, they come to form the truth of what mindfulness is. Quite apart from what you might think it is, what, what might some author might say it is what it is in the academic journals but that's what i'm studying that's what i'm trying to to look at is is when something i'm not studying mindfulness i'm studying a discourse in the public sphere that tries to solve problems with what is ostensibly mindfulness i don't i don't have a whole lot to say about what it really is and i'm not comparing it to some ideal i'm saying this is what it becomes and i find that interesting because in this way it's a, it's a window to culture it's a, it tells us about our own cultural uh, cultural beliefs, these sorts of things that when people hear it, they go, ah, yes, that's it. And what, what got me into this was many, many years ago, I was listening to a podcast, and I remember it was, it was by Pierre Luigi Sacco. I even remember the name of the, the speaker. And it was the first time that I'd heard the, the so-called happiness paradox, where it was like, you know, these scientists, they've done all these studies, and they have proven, proven that money doesn't buy happiness. So... There's this graph, and if you look, if you look, money goes up, income goes up, GDP goes up, but when people's self-reported happiness going all the way back through time, it doesn't move at all. So money doesn't buy happiness. I remember I was like, I don't know how old I was, maybe 19 years old, and I was like, yeah, man, and I thought that this was really left-wing, and I immediately believed it, immediately. And I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? Did I look at the studies? And then I went, I, I, I thought, you know, the more that I looked into it, the more I thought it was a bit weird. Like, why would CEOs and capitalists and well-to-do economists be interested in telling me money doesn't buy happiness? I, I thought, shouldn't they be saying the opposite? It had this, like, leftish kind of feel to it. And then the more that I looked into it, I, you know, I was like, wait a second. You could put anything on that graph. You could put, like women's perceptions of like racial equality you know and it would, be, it would be like like women's freedom nhs spending you know anything you could put on that graph and be, ah, 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 see has it made us happier but what was the thing that went viral what was the thing before virality was a thing but they went all over it was resonated repeated again and again spoke to my idiotic 19 year old 
so-called leftist head where I was, I am a leftist still, by the way, but I, I like to think that I thought more deeply about it. But, you know, I was like, that has a vaguely leftist ring. And aha, see, I think somehow this society to be countercultural, because that's also a value, right? A cultural value is to be countercultural, is to be authentic. To be authentic, I should reject this. And so immediately it spoke to me. Immediately it had, and it, and I repeated it. I told my, my boyfriend at the time, now my husband, I was like, see, you know, I just listened to this podcast today and it's been, you know, scientifically proven. So this is what I'm studying. These very kinds of things. When you hear it, you go, ah, yes, ah, yes. And the question is why? And you said that, it, you know, you can find it in romanticism and you can see it across like post 1960s, sorry, well, 1960s and then post 1960s kind of social movements. And that's exactly right. With some of these critiques around the narratives around mindfulness, can, can mindfulness possibly stop people from improving their lives and the world around them? Now, I know you said that you're not critiquing, you know, your personal practice of meditation. If that's making you happy, then that, that's great. But is, is somehow are these narratives or this implementation in wider society, in structures, somehow stopping positive change from, from moving forward? No, I don't think so. I, I think it's just an invitation to believe in you know to understand social problems in a particular way but when you are met with the very real need to feed yourself and clothe yourself and put a roof over your head and have access to the wealth and beauty of culture that you create every day you're going to get mad and no amount of sitting on a prayer mat is going to stop that and you can see this now for instance in like you know lectures so I, i'm obviously a lecturer at swansea university and lectures are on strike this week and we have well-being Wednesdays, I think we used to anyway, and we have all sorts of emails from management that say, oh, make sure that you take care of your well-being and here's a link to MindFit, blah, blah, blah. And that didn't stop us from going out on strike. Uh, in fact, it made people angrier. It made people angrier. So like I remember during lockdown, I was, my workload tripled. I had to move everything onto like a whole new platform that they decided to introduce. And then they, I got additional teaching they didn't hire anybody. So I was teaching like, I don't know, seven classes or something crazy. I don't remember how many, and they were new. So I was writing new lectures and dealing with students who were very depressed and upset and all these sorts of things, just the extra care. And oh, it was horrible. And I had a 22 month old <clears throat> and a barely four year old. And I was working through the night literally like not sleeping and I would work into the next day and I would go to bed the next night and I was like losing my mind and I remember getting an email that told me it's so important to take time out of your day and here's a link to uh, our well-being pages with links to mindful meditation and I was so mad I was like you think you know if anything it made me angrier so all that I'm doing is I'm saying this is an invitation to conceive of the world through, through these categories and I'm saying I'm inviting you to reject that <laughs> and to see the world through these categories that I think that this is a better way to understand things this will move us forward to a way of living that I think will be better than this and it might actually solve some of these problems and I'm just saying you know don't acquiesce don't think that that this is you know I'm sort of engaging in the same kind of claims making that they are that mindfulness gurus and policymakers are and I'm offering a different interpretation. I know some people might be invited to believe this, but as I said, I think at the end of the day, it's a discourse that tries to kind of, it makes an attempt to uh, quell that kind of discontent, however unsuccessfully. But I think, I think for me, the main issue isn't that it will stop people from rising up. I think we have other problems why people aren't rising up. It's Again, as I said, it's like the, the legacy of the 20th century, the destruction of social movements. And I think these things are like more unified movements. But now we have like single issue social movements. But the destruction of all of that is that I, that I think some of this, these discourses arise out of as well and become symptomatic of that deeper destruction. But I don't think that they're causing it. They're arising out of it. And the, old, and the, the dangerous thing, if I can maybe call it that, maybe that's even too much. No. Uh, I don't think it's too much. I think the, the the real risk isn't that people won't revolt, but that it kind of just feeds into and offers me an opportunity to actually critique a broader cultural outlook that is deeply misanthropic, that is deeply unhuman, inhumane, and encourages a kind of deepening of the problemization of the self. And that, I think, is 
endemic in social movements and does kind of inhibit us from any kind of robust organization or is part of the inhibition where it's like no really what we have to do and i see this all the time where it's like oh before we can even have like any kind of movement first we need to fix people oh don't we don't you think that first we would need to do such and such so it's like it comes this kind of deferral activity and then i think it also has policy implications where it implicitly problematizes certain groups as having some sort of internal problem and then you never really get any other kinds of solutions so I think the issue is less that it stops people from in, in, in rising up. I think there's it's quite, quite a lot going on there. I think it is part of or it reflects some of those problems and certainly does nothing to undermine them or challenge them, which is what I'm trying to do by sort of using this as a jumping off point to talk about the other possibilities of subjectivity that exist. But also I think when it gets used in policy, it does become a way of just endlessly deferring, actually solving problems to basically middle class job creation programs. Right, right. So my next question, I, I mean, you basically did answer this, but there's some some things I, I wanted to, to clarify or, or some things that maybe people aren't, aren't aware of. But uh, so I'm a child of the 80s and 90s, and, and I just took self-esteem as, as, as common sense. Again, it's just there in the background. It's always yeah. been there, right? And then when I started reading about it, well, wow, you know, it was, it was an idea that was really thought up in the 1980s and government money went into promoting self-esteem. Oh, yeah. Curriculum to create it. But yeah, tons, tons, tons. Lots of public money. Lots of curriculums. Instruction in self-esteem. Self-esteem programs, right? So mm -hmm. something I, I never realized, so I wanted to clarify that because I'm sure lots of listeners and watchers also didn't realize that. And and also you mentioned, you know, the self-esteem later gave uh, way to, to happiness. And we also have uh, wellness. So mindfulness is, is sold as something, like when we're talking about the narratives around mindfulness, that, that's very ancient, but it's also new. So, mm -hmm. so to really clarify it, is it part of these these cascading trends going from self-esteem to wellness to happiness to psychedelic therapy, et cetera? Well, obviously, like happiness, well-being, mental health, mindfulness, these things, they have different origins and tons and tons of different claims made about them. But they, yes, they are all part of this cascade in that they become swept up into public claims making as all-purpose causes and solutions to social problems. And that's the thing that they have in common. Um, that they, you know, a ton of government money gets uh, spent on them. They become all pervading critiques. Uh, you know, the tons and tons of books with the, with this word in the title becomes, you know, headline headline making and policymakers want to jump on that because, and also they seem really positive. They just, it, they seem like valence issues. Like who could possibly argue? And then you move conversations onto this very agreeable ground. So I remember I was on BBC's The Big Questions once. I've been on it actually like four or five times, but this one particular episode, which I think you can get on YouTube still, it was really interesting because Sophie Howe, the Welsh you know, Wellbeing of Future Generations minister was on and the, the topic was happiness. And she's all like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone's saying it's all oh, happiness is this and happiness is, and then somebody puts their hand up in the audience and she says, yeah, it's all well and good. You can talk about happiness, but we in the Welsh Valleys don't have jobs. And she, she kind of like, she goes, oh, that's such a great point. And she does this hand waving. And at the end of it, she's like, what we, and it's just a travesty in this nation, like that we don't have good mental health care and that we, we absolutely need, it's been underfunded for all these years. And I was like, do you see what she just did there? And I interrupted her. Thank God. <laughs> you know, they don't give you the last word in this show, but I was like, every, nothing that you said has anything to do with the concerns that she raised. You just totally change the conversation because you don't know how. I didn't say this bit, but I just said nothing in that little tarot had anything to do with what she just said. And then the presenter cut me off. <laughs> but that, that whole tarot had nothing to do with like jobs because she can't create jobs at the drop of a hat. This is something that policymakers aren't like puppet masters for the economy. They're very much at the whims of the economic cycles of boom and bust. They have very limited, there are certain things that they can do, but if they could just like create jobs and make economic growth happen at the drop of a hat, then we wouldn't have crises. And it was, it was really ubiquitous. And in fact, I did a speech, you're from Canada, right? So did you do speech competitions? I did, yeah. So yeah, I did speech competitions and I used to be really good at them. 
And I, I chose self-esteem as the topic of a speech when I was like 10 or 11 years old. I still remember my plagiarized Jack Canfield start, which was, I believe that self-esteem is the bottom line of every personal problem that anyone ever has. When you feel good about yourself, you believe that you can do anything. And why did I pick self-esteem? <laughs> because I knew that I had this sense that it was kind of everywhere. And I knew that the adults, when I talked about it, got very excited. And I wanted to win. <laughs> but yeah, it was like, and I did this program. My parents were separated. And so they put me in this program called the Rainbow Program. I don't know if it still exists. I looked it up years later. And it was based on this idea of like building self-esteem. And interestingly, I was going through a lot of trouble because obviously the things that were happening. And I remember like when I couldn't get a math problem, I kicked a chair. I was really upset. I kicked a chair. And my teacher kind of looked at me and was like, oh. And then they put me in this program. <laughs> And interestingly, after being in the program for some time, I stopped kicking chairs. But why? Why? Because of the program? No, it was rather embarrassing having to sit there and talk about your feelings. And I just made stuff up. I just said whatever the hell they wanted me to say. Like, I didn't have any deep insights into my own psychology. What happened? Well, there, were, there was a little boy in that class, that group, who became my best friend. And I spent every waking moment with him and his family after that. And I had an enormous crush on him. <laughs> and this occupied my mind. <laughs> and we got to play and do all sorts of things. And it was this super annoying about 30 minutes where you had to divulge a bunch of crap. And then after that, you got to go to the gym and play with stuff that you weren't normally allowed to play with. And me and this little boy had this wonderful time together. And we became very, very good friends. And when I had something outside of myself, that I was interested in and concerned about. I forgot my problems. I, I was, I, you know, and it literally took me out of my home by going over to my, my friend's house all the time. And it's just wonderful, wonderful memories of that time for me, even though it was a very hard time, would have been a very hard time. So it wasn't that, it was like being a social human being <laughs> that helped me to come out of myself and my problems. And so I think, you know, a lot of these things if you look at the kind of, what do you call it? The, the studies that are done of efficacy. I don't know why I'm not thinking of the word at the moment. But anyways, a lot of them show that they don't do anything. But even if they did do something, it's very hard to tell. Because society and human life is so incredibly complex. So incredibly complex. It's very difficult to know whether or not like that intervention has actually caused it. It could have been something secondary. Which I think in this case, for me, it was definitely the secondary effect of, of getting a whole bunch of kids together and then making friends. And uh, yeah, so anyway, it was very much like sort of part of the culture. It was, And there was never any evidence that raising self-esteem actually was the root cause or solution to any of these problems. And it's funny because if you look at that first self-esteem California tax task force, the end of that, which was like millions was spent on it, not millions hundreds of thousands, but on self-esteem, like it was millions. This was a humongous industry. At the end of that initial task force, they said there is no evidence. But here's what they said <laughs> after that. They were so convinced that self-esteem was the cause and solution to everything. They said, well, the issue is that it just causes so much that it's impossible to isolate. Right. It's just, it, right. so it's, it's because it causes everything, it's very difficult to see what it causes. That was their that was their salute that was their answer. And so the, even when the evidence doesn't sort of fit, they rely they fall back on common sense. And you see this all the time. If you go through like the um, SEAL program, social and emotional aspects of learning in the UK, um, it was a big review that happened. And again, it was there's no evidence of efficacy, and uh, might have even done some harm. <laughs> and they were like, but common sense says. Emotions obviously are the root of all these problems. So the problem must be that people didn't adhere to the program enough. Same thing with another mindfulness thing. There was a, a mindfulness review that came out. I wish I could remember off the top of my head the names of all of these papers if anybody wanted to look them up. But they're, they're all cited in my, my forthcoming book. But again, it was, you know, very disappointing. Didn't do anything. Students didn't like the interventions. They found them really boring. And they were very forthcoming and honest about this. Yes, the intervention did nothing. But then if you read through all of their comments that they're making about their program, they're like, well, the issue is we didn't try hard enough. We didn't implement enough. We didn't stick to the program enough. <laughs> 
And they will do this for every single one of these things. Uh, um, and the only cure, the only thing that gets us beyond it is a new fad. Yeah. Because nobody talks about like, oh, we've got a problem of knife crime. Well, what we really need is like a self-esteem intervention in schools. But it's still there in the culture, right? It's still, there's still a residue of that. Oh, well, you know, this probably has something to do with self-esteem. But it's not going to get you a grant. It's not going to, you know, it's not going to light a fire under policymakers. But the next thing will. And, you know, mindfulness won't just do nothing. That that underlying kind of ethos, this is what Ron Purser says, I think, where this sort of underlying kind of idea that the message that's given is, or the invitation is, I have this problem. What, what, is it, what is it in my brain that has caused it? That's the sort of lesson that's given in these kinds of classes. And that's, that doesn't get critiqued. That doesn't go away. That's there for the next big thing. Right. Right. So I, I don't mean to, to beat a, a dead horse, but I'm I'm just the voice of the people. I, I'm the Vox Populi of, of the comments we're going to be getting on YouTube and on okay. the <laughs> uh, and on social media. And and I, I imagine people are going to say something like this, and, and perhaps it is outside of, of your purview, because again, to to, to to beat another dead horse, you were a sociologist studying sociology. But but mm -hmm. doesn't mindfulness have the ability to positively impact anxiety, work stress, self esteem, violence, mental health, chronic illness? Educational outcomes, healthcare costs, prisoner reoffending, re and improve your immune system, creativity, emotional balance, energy levels, sleep, learning and focus, capacity for compassion and kindness, blood pressure, mood, stress during pregnancy, and physical pain. And isn't there 40 years of hard scientific evidence proving it does all this? So with all this, how, how can we not, even if we have some of these, these troubling narratives that you're discussing around it? Yeah, and I named even more than that in, in my study of it, that there was something like 100 that I could name in a sample of 125 newspaper articles. There was 100 problems that could be solved, they said. So, yeah, I mean, the thing is, looking at the studies of, of efficacy, there are all sorts of, if you want to sort of go into it and be a sort of critical realist about it, there, for all, for all of these fads, there are all kinds of, of studies which seem to show efficacy. And then if you look at the studies, they tend to be plagued by certain problems. The reviews tend to be done by people who are already invested in that particular issue, in that particular, sorry, intervention. And they're the ones who are doing the reviews. And when you have reviews that are impartial, the results tend to be quite a bit less sensational. The sample sizes tend to be small. There's always the problem of, of things like participant bias that people want to say. Like when I give like a lecture, if I give people like a little sheet of paper at the end of it, how did I do? They always say 10 out of 10. And I'd like to believe that it's because I'm awesome. But the, you know, the, 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 if you give that, if, if I were to give it in a different circumstance, away from my smiling face, watching them fill in the thing, you might get a different response. Or people want to please me, they like me, and they, they you know, they probably don't remember. And in fact, I did a study of this once on an intervention that I did in the classroom. And years later, I asked the students, the students who had been in that class over the years, I did a survey and I said, do you remember this intervention that I did? Do you remember the, the lesson? And I think it was something like 64% of the students remembered. And, and I asked them, what was the point? And none of them remembered. <laughs> They still rated it very highly. They, still, they very much enjoyed the class. But what did it do in the long term? Anyways, there are lots of critical studies that are emerging. And this is the same thing for a lot of the therapeutic fads that I've looked at, where like happiness, for instance, like promoting happiness. And now I can talk about happiness being like a, a therapeutic fad. Promoting happiness is like the a panacea of social problems. So you go, yeah, 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 whatever. But when I was talking about it in 2008, I got this exact same claim and this exact same pushback. No, no, no. There are tons and tons of scientific studies. Science is hard as rocks under pincers. Now it's 15 years later that we have, it takes time to do the kind of research that is independent and so on, to put together systematic reviews and so on. It takes time. And often by the time that comes out, the fad is already unwinding. And so, you know, now this sort of critical research is starting to come out, which reveals a lot of these underlying issues and a lot of that research. You know, you have like a wealth of research and it's just like tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of bad studies 
doesn't add up to a good, you know, <laughs> a good intervention. Now, I don't deny, however, that mindfulness does have some benefits, absolutely, or people wouldn't do it. Like it's definitely, there's definitely a lot of good stuff that it does, particularly around pain relief, but nowhere near, nowhere near the amount that is said or claimed of it. The inflated claims that are made, there's, there are like quite a few modest effects, but I think that's sort of where the best evidence is. But toward the present, even it's interesting because even I was always like, oh, well, you know, probably around these particular things, it's, it's overstated. But now even that evidence is starting to be questioned. And it's interesting because the claims were made, and this is the same for all these therapeutic facts, the claims were made for its scientifically proven nature. It's just science as hard as nail proves this long before there was an army of people doing, si doing studies on their interventions. So John Kabat-Zinn admitted in 2003, I think it was, that early on the science wasn't there. But if you go back and look at his claims making, that's not what he was saying. He was saying a scientist, like he was saying, this is science and we've done studies and so on. And he didn't say the studies were on like 50 people, but he, this was just science proves it. And they make very, very inflated scientific claims. And it's the same thing with happen the happiness discourse. Like Richard Laird said to, I can't remember who it was, said to policymakers or something like that, like, oh, we know, you know, we need to act on this. And they're like, well, one of our, uh, this, this, this anecdote that I'm telling is in Edgar Cavanaugh's and a Ava Luz's book, Manufacturing Happy Citizens, if you want to go and have a look at, before I mangle the anecdote. But anyway, but where Richard Laird, who was like this, like happiness guru, who's like the big proponent of the happiness in schools and so on in the UK and just affecting a huge range of policies. You know, he was talking to somebody, I think it was a policymaker, and he was like, and they were like, oh, well, what about the evidence? And he goes, oh, the evidence is satisficing. But if you look at his claims making, he, he's like, I, science is hard as nails underpins this. It's just, there's a consensus. But there wasn't. And so these claims often precede any evidence. And then you go through a phase where the evidence is, is poor, and then it sort of, or it like, you know, it, it's tons and tons of evidence comes out. But if you kind of look at it, the... It, it's subject to all of these kinds of flaws and then that's not even to mention the general kinds of problems that we have with science at the moment which is like p-hacking the fact that only positive studies tend to get published so you can do like a hundred studies and that show no effect and you're not going to have those published you show one you do one study that shows an effect that's the one that gets published anyway so you have all these sorts of problems and then this starts to come out this, these critical reviews start to come out and it, and the original sort of strength of the research become, comes to be questioned and people start to rely on common sense and, and they start to fall back on that. And this is what's happening with some of the mindfulness reviews that are coming out. People go, well, I know, even if that's not true, we know, we know, it's just common sense that, and this is what they did in the, that, that really negative review that came out with this huge, the biggest study on mindfulness and education, which showed that it didn't do anything. And my and my and there were even negative effects, and well, it's just they kept falling back. Well, it must be, it must be. So we'll just try harder, you know. And it takes, you know, and, and it takes time. And what what happens is that it's not questioned in the end by the science because often it's on the wane, even as the science is coming out. And it's uh, it's people have moved on to the next thing by the time the really damning stuff comes out. Right. Right. And, and that leads logically to to my next question, which is, you know, I'm sure when yoga first first hit a big, people were like, this is a trend and it's going to go away soon. But it, it really seems to be kind of integrated into society. It's not going anywhere. It's, maybe it's not as popular as it once was, even though it's probably yeah. more popular than ever. So to make a long story short, is do you think mindfulness is going to be kind of integrated in the, the way that, say, yoga is, or is it going to go the way of the pet rock? What's, what's your, what's your, your, I know this is a guess, but what's your gut feeling or, or, or any data that you've seen that the trend is ending? So I talk about this in my book. <laughs> Sorry, I keep saying this, but I, I draw a lot on the, the literature on fads and unlike fads, like, you know, I don't know, Six Sigma or some kind of like management fads, they're very, they're confined to very small areas of society or even something like, like educational fads, like whole language approaches to reading that you know, the pendulum swings back and forth and there people will come in and out. It'll come in and out of fashion or like hybrids of it and that sort of thing. But there's, they're quite confined to small areas, but these kinds of therapeutic fads are interesting because they go everywhere. The sort of tentacles are everywhere. I mean, like you can even get like architecture, mindful architecture, 
happiness architecture. Like there, it's just, there's nothing that you can't tack that, the, the fat onto happy, blah, blah, blah. And so what winds up happening is you, every time a fad blows through, you create spaces and institutions and people whose job it is to do this thing and their livelihood depends on it. Right. And so they will do everything they can to defend it. And once it's gone, they'll be looking for the new fad they're, they're looking for the next thing. So there's that, that's what happens and it can wash away and be quite quiet. But I think these things, because, because they're everywhere, but also because they kind of have this fit with the underlying, they resonate with plausibility structures of our society, put use Berger Luckman's terms, they leave a residue and they never fully recede. So self-esteem is still ubiquitous. Like the, there was a study that I pulled up where they looked around and they were like, a lot of the words, sort of catchphrases of self-esteem are still very much in the vocabulary, the cultural vocabulary, like I'm special, <laughs> this kind of thing. They're still, they're still ubiquitous. They can't like, as I said, they can't light a fire under people. They're not going to get you a big government grant or something like that. But they still, you know, you still have it in your mind. You still talk about like, oh, I've got low self-esteem or whatever, which might be true. But I mean, like as a system of making sense of social problems, it's not there. But in terms of our cultural vocabularies, they're definitely still there. So I think that I, I definitely think that these things will stick around 100%. And in fact, I've, I've sort of tried to quantify this by looking at news media discourses. And I like the news media before anybody criticizes me. I like the news media because it's lots and lots of people from many, many different backgrounds who come onto this public stage and speak to what they believe to be a very broad audience. Now, they might think this audience is a little left-leaning or a little right-leaning or a little center or whatever. But they're speaking to what they think is a mass of people, which is different than if someone's talking to Twitter, they're talking to their just their followers, people who largely believe them, or what they hope to be maybe a broader kind of appeal, but they'll say things that they wouldn't necessarily say on a mass stage. So I like this. You get lots of people coming in trying to compete for attention. And this means that claims in the news media tend to be highly rhetorical and rhetoric is a window to culture. Anyway, so I've tried to kind of quantify this looking at newspaper discourses, and you can see for each one of these idioms that I've looked at, self-esteem, mindfulness, happiness, well-being, and mental health. Well-being and mental health are on the ascendant, and each one is, so if you quantify the number of times that they are mentioned in news media, in major newspapers, the number, like, you can see, like, self-esteem is a parabola, but it's not exactly that. It's, it's, it never goes back to where it was, which was nil. Okay. It's still there, but it's it goes like this, and then it kind of trails off, but still at a higher level than it was. So that's what, like something like a pet rock is going to be different than that. It's just you know quietly forgotten. And then mindfulness is just dipping, and happiness again, it's that parabola, and it's just it's leveled off, but it's higher than it was. And you can see that well-being is sh has shot up. And each one, each one is higher, is mentioned more than starts at a higher level than the one previously, because I think that they kind of, and I wasn't really able to, it was very, very difficult. I was trying to like actually bring together like a, some really strong evidence for this, but I wasn't able to, it was really difficult. And I think you could probably just use Google Engram, but I think that these terms, they kind of like prepare the way for the next. So it was like with self-esteem, in fact, Hewitt, John P. Hewitt wrote a book in 19... 98 called the myth of self-esteem just looking for it on my bookshelf the myth of self-esteem something like so oh, solving problems and finding happiness in america happiness was happiness and well-being happiness and well-being happiness and well-being constantly and then it just was about well-being and then it was well-being and mental health well-being and mental health well-being and mental health and now it's mental health and well-being and mental health become so elided that they mean in public discourses but they mean essentially the same thing it's very difficult to kind of differentiate what people mean by these things anyway so i think they they leave a residue, they prepare the ground for the next thing. And yeah, they will stay in the culture, but they will not be, you know, not capable of kind of having the resonance in terms of a belief about their ability to solve problems that they do now. That's for the next thing. Right, right. So you mentioned the, uh, those influential hot dogs or the Frankfurters, Eric mm -hmm. Fromm. And for those watching at home, people, some people watch, some people listen, but I've been throwing up the, the web address for Sublation Media, who you do quite a bit with. And, and you know, Sublation has quite a lot of content on, on psychoanalysis. 
And you know, yeah. we don't have time to get into all that. I don't even know if I understand all that. But to oversimplify, doesn't psychoanalysis and Freudo Marxism say that humans are irrational and they're lacking subjects and there's actually political ramifications from understanding this? Is is this different from some of these mindfulness narratives, or is it just something you you don't vibe with in general? Since I'm sure there's lots yeah, of perspectives. Something I don't something I don't vibe with in general. Okay, cool, cool. <laughs> So I don't know. It's fine. Like that, just because I think that something is is incorrect and a bad understanding of social problems doesn't mean I'm going to like stop people from saying it. It's fine. So I mean, I I think it's interesting, and I think there's a lot. I I really like Slavoj Žižek, for example, but I think I I think he has kind of a different perspective. His book on like the, the ticklish subject, I think, is kind of saying some of the things that I'm saying. Or James Hartfield's The Death of the Subject Explained, which is, I think, a more accessible version of a very similar argument which is that there's been this sort of destruction of the subject over time. That's the sort of central argument that I'm making, that as we've been unable to realize the promises of bourgeois revolutions like the French Revolution, you know, liberty, equality, fraternity, you know, when you look out into the world, you don't see that. You see unfreedom, inequality, war. And that needs to be explained. And the right historically has explained it as a defect in the human soul. As it's just it's just about human difference. We have inequality because it reflects a different an essential difference in human beings. It's partially true, right? There's always going to be a certain amount of difference in human beings. As an explanation for our class system, I think is not correct because we have many many different ways of like organizing societies. But you can explain that in many different ways. And what's happened is that over time, because of the trends that I was talking about, the awful trends of the 20th century. That has been more and more internalized. It's just, it's, we will never move beyond this impasse because the impasse arises out of humanity itself. That's sort of the, the, the legacy that we are living in right now. And in my book, I try to explain it through a few representative anecdotes. I don't know how well I did this. <laughs> I tried anyway to explain it through, like, for instance, somebody like a couple of, I make a couple of contrasts between like Blaise Pascal and Voltaire and Marquis, the Marquis de Condorcet and um, Thomas Malthus. So Condorcet is extremely optimistic about modernity. And he obviously writes this famous book, which goes through 10 phases of humanity, just progressing through better and better and better and better. And the 10th chapter is like the future. Humanity is just liberated. And we like, we've solved all these problems. We don't, we're not even going to die anymore. We like death that was like surrounded. And it's amazing because it, the fact that he wrote this when he was being hunted down during the terror is a testament to the incredible durability of his optimism. And then a few years later, Thomas Malthus writes his essay on the principle of population, which was expressly written against Condorcet. And it's very, very, you know, he's very disparaging. And he's like, he's, you can almost hear in the tone of it, Malthus laughing at, at Condorcet. And he says, no, look, this, uh, you know, Condorcet is saying, look, the reason why we haven't got there yet is because of uh, an inequality in society, in society. Like, and he is incredibly radical for his time because unlike a lot of Enlightenment philosophers who couldn't really see beyond their time, where they're like, equality and rights of man, and I do mean man, and not you, you're not really, you know, not just, I mean, white men. And so, you know, they were very like particular about it. Condorcet was very radical in that he was he was he extended his belief in the incredible powers of humanity to women and to slaves and so on, which was you know, and it was like we will get beyond this. This is an essential inequality in society. It has nothing to do with human beings. It's in society, and we will move beyond this. Just give us. It's only a matter of time. Incredible optimism, and Malthus is saying no. We will never be able to get from where we are to that potential future because they could see it. They could see it. Like Condorcet could see that future. It's this, this gap between the present and the future is that gap between, you know, chapters one through nine and chapter 10. And we will bridge it. We will get there. And Malthus says no, because the void between the, the present and the future is a void within humanity. We are never going to get there. You should just learn to live within it, learn to enjoy it. And, and, and recognize that your the inability to reach that kind of enjoyment is actually good for your soul. It's you know the the the, the fact that we will always have want and need spurs us on to industriousness and so on. Not the not the privileged classes or whatever they can just consume. It's fine, but they're doing their their part. You know, or another one was like Blaise Pascal. This idea where he says 
I have become convinced that all the problems of man come down to, this is paraphrasing, obviously, come down to his inability to live contentedly in one room. And I, I love that because it's like this, this tension between accepting the present and finding some kind of serenity in yourself, in your room, and not needing anything beyond that. And this desire to push beyond it to something in the future. And I think we've been grappling with this tension as a society for a long time. And we have discourses that ask us to live within that void, to accept it as part of the human condition, to like, you know, put some nice, I always joke about it. It's like, put some nice curtains up. It's a perfectly fine void. Like, <laughs> or, it, you know, it's, it's, the void is us. It's humanity. It's something within us. We will never get beyond this. It's just part of our human nature and we should just accept it and learn to live within it and be happy within it, find whatever happiness we can as like the world kind of goes by and have that resilience to not crumble when it does versus being an active kind of person engaging in the world to bridge the gap between the present and the future. And we've never been able to do that. And a lot of people have been thrown down into that void and died there. <laughs> the quest for, you know, thinking about the USSR and so on. You know, it's it's a real bad history and we're kind of stuck. And I think we're kind of narrating that impasse over and over and over again. Is it us or is there something that we can do? Well, the perfect place to, to wrap up. Dr. Foley, can you tell people again where to find you online, about your upcoming book, the title, when it's coming out? Just uh, give us all, all the good plugs. Sure. So my up, my forthcoming book is Significant Emotions, Rhetoric and Vulnerability. Nope, sorry. Rhetoric and Social Problems in a Vulnerable Age. I always forget the subtitle because I changed it at one point. So I mixed the two titles together. Anyway, so that's coming out in a... I, I got busted. I tried to republish a graph that I had published elsewhere. So I had to redo a graph that took ages and ages and ages. So it's, it's been delayed. But yeah, that should come out before the end of this year. And then I'm on Sublation Media every Monday at 5 p.m. UK time. And I've also got my own podcast on Sublation Media and on our Patreon, which is at patreon.com slash diet soap. Well, cool. Okay, thanks so much. And again, you know, you were talking about some of the reception to your work on social media. You know, if you didn't like this show, if you disagreed with Dr. Frawley, make sure you share the show and say why. Maybe watch it 10 or 20 times to really get, get the points that you don't like. Send it to somebody and be like, isn't this awful? I hated this. So maybe, huh. maybe like and subscribe for future content that you'll, you'll also either dislike or... or... Yeah, yep. equally, if, if you liked it, you could also let me know. Like... <laughs> let her know. Let us know in the comments. I think outside of like and dislike, this, this, this is sort of a weird show. I mean, it's a weird show in general, right? It's about obscure religious stuff for the most part. But uh, we have quite a wide range of perspectives, and, and I think sometimes that does give people whiplash. But I, I'm really proud of having this wide uh, range of perspectives, and it's quite a wide range. So I actually, all jokes aside, I am happy to, to, to hear from people. Give us your feedback, and of course, let us know if you like it. All jokes aside, let us know if you like it. They, they loved it. Okay, Dr. Frawley, thanks so much. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.